Thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, so my presentation is called Beyond the Technology, Privacy, Trust, and Security in the Cloud. It's going to take a look at the social and political aspects of cloud. Um, it's mainly going to focus on the public cloud, uh, not just in terms of infrastructure as a service, but also the SaaS layer. And it'll touch on the internet and privacy in general. So given the potential controversial topic, I'm just going to throw some disclaimers out there. Uh, any opinion expressed in this fall presentation are my own and do not represent the views of my employer. Uh, also, to avoid any awkwardness, I tried to remove most negative uh, references to companies that actually participate in OpenStack. So you'll need to kind of do your own digging there. And lastly, I did not fact check every single item in this presentation, but I've, I have references and I think they're listed as well. So you can follow up on that. So just to introduce myself um, so you can kind of figure out if there's any biases in this presentation. My name is Goran Chung. Uh, I've lived in Canada, Canada my whole life. Um, I'm an engineer, uh, not a law major or anything that actually relates to this field. Uh, I'm not an activist or an anarchist. I don't have like a black bar tattoo on my body. I've never participated in a protest. And that said, I'm not completely apolitical. Uh, I've taken a single university course in Canada's role in glo global development. Uh, I did pretty well in that course. Um, granted, it was a first year course and I was a fifth year student at the time, but I did pretty well. Um, and lastly, I'm aware of the optics of having a privacy talk coming from a person that works for a Chinese-based company and whose LinkedIn profile just says working on data collection dot, dot, dot. But that said, uh, let's get started. So I don't have to tell you about the cloud. Uh, it's the Cloud Summit. Um, everything's being adopted in the cloud. Uh, new businesses are being built as cloud-only enterprises. And it's a big business opportunity. Uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they all saw huge spikes in revenue in their cloud divisions. Uh, I think in their latest earnings from a few weeks ago, they all declared about 20%, over 20% increases in their cloud revenue. And the research firm Gartner estimates that over a trillion dollars in IT spending will be directly or indirectly affected by the shift towards cloud during the next five years. And this is echoed by Bain, which is a management consulting firm, um, which estimates that public spending alone will, be, will reach about $390 billion by the year 2020. So over the last few years, you've, everyone's been hyping up the cloud, and they've kind of told you that same statement, how the cloud is amazing. And the reason for this talk is not to tell you the cloud sucks um, and to avoid it. I mean, I work on the cloud. But I do feel like there's another story to be told and to, to, for you guys to consider. So we in technology, we're always talking about disruption. Uh, Uber disrupting the taxi uh, model. Theranos disrupting healthcare. Cloud disrupting IT spending. And it seems to be ingrained in us as technology, technologists that we can do pretty much anything in the cloud or on a computer. In the book, The Hackers, part of the hacker ethic they describe is some of the items is that you can create art and beauty on a computer, and, you can cr and the computers can change your life for the better. Often, as technologists, we take this to the extreme, and we have this unbreakable belief that we can do anything on the cloud, and everything we do on the cloud is beautiful. To, bu to put it bluntly, um, sometimes we as technologists are kind of full of ourselves. So now that I've kind of alienated myself, um, so I want to talk about uh, cloud. Um, also, because of our arrogance, uh, we don't really consider our, uh, the ramifications and side effects of what we do. So Justin Kahn, who's the co-founder of Twitch, said that there are things we were optimizing for that had unintended cons consequences to describe how social networks had inadvertently created these hives of tribalism. Even Stephen Hawking gave a similar, similar warning recently. I should uh, add that that quote has nothing to do with cloud technology from Stephen Hawking. Uh, ju he just said that we as humans are innately kind of aggressive and technology kind of helps amplify that. But acknowledging our flaws aside, let's step back and consider what the biggest concerns people have ab about the cloud. So in the same Bain report regarding IT spending, while there was more confidence in the shift towards cloud over the last three years, they found that 35% of individuals cite data security as their still their biggest concern regarding cloud computing. 
in addition to data security concerns, we, a lot of concerns about how corporations are undermining users uh, because they're unsure what level of privacy is maintained because everything that's referenced in the cloud is kind of hidden behind pages of legalese. Um, if you look at the iCloud Terms of Service, there, it contains a lot of text about how Apple reserves the right to remove or access uh, anything they deem objectionable or if reason, reasonably necessary. Uh, regarding governments, as a side effect, side effect of the NSA leaks regarding pris, uh, for PRISM, many people are unsure of how far reaching the arm of the government is. It raises fears that using a central public system enables those with authority to shut down anything that they deem unfit. And there is a lot of precedence for this. Um, recently, Turkey blocked access to Wikipedia. And previously in 2010, the Egyptian government shut down all, all internet access uh, so citizens could not communicate and discover news during the Arab Spring. And this is also done in the Western world as well uh, for vastly different reasons. Uh, during the underground bombings in 20, 2005, the UK government shut down all mobile networks to avoid any bombs being detonated remotely. So with all these actors, it causes the public to be unsure if the public cloud is something they can fully trust. Uh, in a survey done by Intel Security, they, interviewed, they surveyed over 2,000 professionals for its annual cloud security research study. And they asked the question, to what extent do you trust the public cloud to keep your, your organization's sense of data secure? And while they found a growing percentage of respondents had more faith in the cloud, 29% tw uh, of respondents voiced some level of distrust about the public cloud, and only 23% said they fully trusted it. When asked about what cloud architecture, architecture they had deployed, they saw a greater shift towards a hybrid solution instead of a fully private or a fully public solution. So all these concerns were kind of summarized by Chantal Bernier, who's a Denton's lawyer. Uh, she reiterated that the four biggest concerns regarding cloud computing are accountability complexity, lack of data sovereignty, or loss of data sovereignty, lack of transparency, and the challenges of safeguarding information on the internet. So let's dive deeper into each of the concerns. Uh, first, we'll take a look at data security. So over the past year, there have been, there have been multiple studies that have revealed a marked increase in uh, cybercrime. The uh, most famous breach would be the one that affected Yahoo. So in 2014, in 2014, they had a reported 200 million accounts breached, which they disclosed in 2016, uh, and they followed that up by disclosing another breach this year about, of, a, of about 32 million uh, accounts. And as we mo move more and more uh, critical information into the cloud, such as healthcare records, passports, um, IoT devices that like uh, city infrastructure, the details are kind of sparse ab about uh, exactly how the organizations are going to protect that data. So research uh, from insurance spe specialist Lloyd's suggests that 92% of companies in the EU have been have suffered suffered a data breach in the last five years. Uh, it should be noted that Lloyd's is an insurance company that wants to sell you cyber insurance. With all the breaches that's happened recently, cybersecurity has become a huge business in itself. Um, in 2013, the Wall Street Journal estimated the cost of cybercrime in the US alone was approximately $100 billion. In 2015, Lloyd's estimated that number to be $400 billion. And in 2016, Juniper Research uh, means that the cost of data breaches can, may reach $2.1 trillion by the year 2019 uh, globally. And recently, IBM CEO echoed this. Uh, she said that cybercrime may be the greatest threat to every company in the world. So in, in addition to cybercrime, the role of corporations also raises issues. Not taking into account the active participation of many corporations in the surveillance program PRISM, uh, corporations have been actively undermining the privacy of citizens for business. Um, so in the PBS documentary, uh, United States of Secrets, the state senator for California recalls the time she met uh, Sergey Brin from Google. 
She says, quote, we walk into the room and it's myself and two of my staff, my chief of staff and one of my attorneys. And across from us is Larry, Sergey, and, and their attorney. All of, all of a sudden, Sergey starts talking to me and he says, Senator, how would you feel if a robot walked into your home and read your diary and your financial records, read your love letters, read everything, but before leaving the house, it imploded. And he said, that's not violating privacy. I immediately said, of course it is, yes it is. And he said, no it's not. Nothing's kept, nobody knows about it. I said, the robot has read everything. Does it know if I'm feeling sad or if I'm feeling fear or is it, or what's happening? And he looked at me and said, oh no, that robot knows a lot more than that. So in addition to just software companies, it's also ISPs as well. So in a very recent FCC ruling, allowing uh, ISPs to sell customer information to advertisers, advertisers without consent, the CTIA, which is the lo main lobbyist group representing mobile broadband companies such as uh, AT&T, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, they argued that web browsing and app usage history was not sensitive information. It also went on to suggest that the consumers should not be wary of their newfound ability to sell customer information and that the more substantial privacy threats for consumers was not the ISPs but the largest email search and social media companies. It suggested that consumer, um, the official response from ISPs themselves was that they do not sell customer data but previously in 2013, AT&T had charged the internet their internet customers about $29 extra per month it, unless they opted into a system that would scan their internet traffic and deliver them personalized advertisements. Uh, this was stopped by the FCC. So while corporations do exploit their customers, they also do try to protect them from the government. Um, so over the last few years, especially in 2016, uh, technology companies have started to encrypt their networks and communications. Beginning in 2013, uh, Google, as a response to the NSA uh, leaks, they encrypted all their internal traffic. Uh, last year, Apple refused to create a backdoor for the FBI to bypass their uh, iPhone encryption. They've also done good things like they've re refused or pledged to refuse to uh, identify individuals to the government want to suppress because of race or beliefs. And they've also tried to help us directly. Um, so Facebook has started using machine learning algorithms to leverage their data trove to help identify individuals who were su suicidal. And uh, suicide's a very important topic. Um, it's one of those, sec it's the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. And it's definitely a promising idea. So researchers in, at Florida State University use machine learning, machine learning to predict with 80 to 90% uh, accuracy whether or not someone would attempt suicide as far off as two years in the future. Uh, that said, it was discovered last week that the Facebook was also targeting ads to these depressed teens. Um, in sales pitches to advertisers, they would boast about how Facebook's algorithms could uh, determine and allow advertisers to pinpoint moments when young people needed a confidence boost. So let's talk about governments now. Um, let's see if my computer randomly explodes. Okay, so the justification for surveillance is always the same. It's for your own security. Um, following the recent attacks on the Westminster in which four people were killed, uh, the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, told the BBC, we need, we need to make sure that the organizations like WhatsApp don't provide a secret place for terrorists to communicate with each other. It is on that reasoning that governments try to get corporations to work with them. Uh, in 2015, the head of China's Cyberspace Administration proposed, proposed a pledge to American tech companies that they will comply with Chinese information policies. And they include a lot of good things like protecting the user privacy of their citizens. Um, but there were also parts of the pledge that were similar to NSA's prison program. So currently in the US, uh, a little bit closer to home, uh, currently the US is under legal battle over the validity of warrants of data in foreign uh, countries, specifically uh, data in Ireland uh, hosted by Microsoft's email systems. So at each level of the, ju of the judicial system, there have been multiple different verdicts awarded, uh, sometimes in favor 
of Microsoft, sometimes in favor of the government. So right now there is no concrete answer on whether the government has the right to access information outside of the U.S. So in addition to that, um, currently there exists no single comprehensive set of rules to govern how to protect cloud data in the United States. There is an email privacy act proposed, um, which would update the current privacy act from 1986, uh, but it would not cover cloud computing specifically, and it's not likely to pass given the current administration. And because, a lot of, because of that, a lot of Americans consider Canada to be like a safe haven. And as a Canadian, I'm here to tell you it's not really. Um, it's an estimated that 90% of all, internet, all Canadian internet traffic runs through the US at some point. Um, and CSEC, which is Canada's NSA, has been found to have very little oversight. In a report from 2013, they found that their oversight committee was a single retired judge who produced an annual, annual review of CSEC conduct, and he's never found a single issue. Also, uh, as, Amer as Canadians, we're not Americans, so all the NSA surveillance tactics are actually legal against us. So the biggest problem, or one of the big problems with government is that often there's a belief that they are infallible and that they have complete foresight. Uh, in the book, Super Forecasting, Philip Teclock uh, looked at, gathered a big uh, group of experts, uh, academics, pundits, and the like, and he ha had them make thousands of predictions relating to economy, war, elections over decades. And the, resu the res results he found was that the average expert was roughly as accurate as a dart throwing chimp, or basically they were no better than random guessing. There were conditions he found that could improve that, um, to, to, which would improve an ind individual's uh, prediction accuracy, uh, but he found that the intelligence community in the US had not, didn't have an environment that, would op that was optimized for this. Also, there's a really stupid person in your Congress right now that said that. <laughs> So even though the government does do a lot of things to kind of remove privacy from us, it does help sometimes. Um, so in the EU and Canada, there are legislation set up to, to have rules on consent um, for the sale of personal information. And it also imposes limitations on what can be collected and for what reason. The EU legislation specifically uh, was passed in 2016 and will be start, it will be enforced starting uh, May 2018. Um, it includes uh, conditions where if a company fails to comply with protecting a user's data, they can be fined up to 20 million euros. And there's a talk about that specific, this uh, legislation specifically later in the week. So with all those concerns, here are some ways to kind of address them as users and as administrators. So you can start by defining policies and educate yourself and the company on these rules. Uh, you, have, you can decide uh, the value of specific data and whether it's safer to store them in the cloud or internally. So Frank Abnail, who is the person that the movie Catch Me If You Can is based off of, he believes that technology alone will, will never defeat a good uh, social, engineer, uh, social engineering game. And he says that the only answer to absolutely is to absolutely educate your employees and about how to protect themselves and how to protect their company. We can also improve transparency of our agreements. Uh, so the Electronic Frontier Foundation publishes uh, scorecards that are easy to understand to help consumers figure out how well a company supports their privacy. Uh, similarly, there's the ISO 27018 uh, standard, which was created to be applied to companies th that adhere to a set of uh, privacy and security requirements. Uh, collaboration does help. Um, so by building an open agreement between multiple parties, it makes it more difficult for a single bad actor or a single company to do bad things. It also makes it more difficult for those who want to do harm as they have to attack multiple companies now. And this also works as a user by leveraging multiple cloud providers. 
So Bo Boeing uses a technique they call shred and scatter, which applies across, where they send data across multiple clouds, so no single cloud has all the data. It makes it difficult as an outsider to piece all that data back together in a comprehensible way. So if you're like me and kind of apathetic to a lot of things, uh, but still recognizes there are issues that exist, uh, you can get others to fight for you. Uh, there are multiple organizations set up for this. Um, the EFF, for instance, is working on lobbying tech companies to protect, encrypt, and delete their user data that could, exploit, that could be exploited in, for policies like mass deportation and increased surveillance. The ACLU is working on passing uh, city ordinances that would rein in police and use of hacking and social media monitoring tools. And there's stuff you can do with technology as well. Uh, so just doing basic good deployment strategies like ensuring virtual networks remain detached from each other. Um, so Google also has a chip, a custom chip that enables hard authentication at a hardware level. Uh, similarly, Intel has a chip called SGX, which does something similar to hardware level encryption. Uh, so you can use technology and kind of, instead of the government monitoring you, you can monitor them as well. Uh, so there's a company called Digital, or an organization called Digital Democracy, which created a bot to record every single word a politician says so it can be fact checked. Um, it also pulls in the financial ties that the politicians have so to provide uh, additional context for their choices. There's also an app called Stance, which lets you record messages to your elected officials, and it will send that message at nighttime when the lines are less busy, and it'll keep sending your message until it actually gets through. Or you can go all in. Uh, so Kevin Mitnick, who's a hacker, said, uh, outlined some good policies on how to go invisible online by using Tor and encryption. And then he goes on further to say that you can get a burner phone from Walmart, but instead of going to Walmart yourself, you hire a homeless man to go to Walmart to avoid being captured on cameras. Or you can just buy uh, fashion accessories that will kind of hide your face from the face uh, detection algorithms. So even if we address all our concerns, we have about cloud, does it even matter? Is it actually worth the trouble? So in a report by, for, in a report examining insider threats by Forcepoint, they found that 14% of European employees claimed that they would sell their login credentials to an outsider for 200 pounds. In the same report, they found that 32% 32, 32 of the employees were unaware or unsure about the potential consequences of a breach. Similarly, in a peer research survey, they found that 69% of us don't actually worry about our own digital security. Uh, so they found that 25% of us will knowingly use a weak password, 54% of us use uh, insecure public Wi-Fi. In another survey by Pew Internet Research, um, they found that depending on your age, about 40 to 50% of people believe that the, go the government should be able to access encrypted communications when investigating crimes. And maybe that's not our fault, this ambivalence to privacy. Um, during the Second World War, psychologist Eric Fromm, in his book, The Escape from Freedom, uh, he thought about why large chunks of the Western world were embracing authoritarianism. He said it was attempting to say it was a fault of a few madmen who gained power over the vast apparatus of the state through nothing but cunning and trickery. But Fromm argued that there was something in, inherent in humanity that feared true freedom and that we would prefer to be dominated. In other words, Fromm thought that our ambivalence and submiss submiss submissiveness was a feature of, our, of humans in general. So why does privacy matter? And this is where it's gonna get a little bit opinionated or even more so. So the government's determination to get, to get its hands on internet data in the name of national security is eroding trust in other nations. And this is why it's important to corporations. Um, as a reaction 
to the, the revelations of NSA snooping, companies in the UK and Canada have added languages to their contracts stipulating that their data must not be stored on US soil. British defense contractor BAE specifically revealed that it had killed plans to adopt Microsoft Cloud Services because Microsoft couldn't guarantee that their data wouldn't leave Europe. In a survey done by Cloud Security and Alliance in 2013, found that 56% of people are now, of companies are now less likely to consider a US-based cloud provider, and that 10% had canceled a project to switch to a non-US-based cloud provider. And according to Forrester Research, because of this lack of trust and as a result of the prison program, it will cost the cloud industry about $47 billion in revenue in, over the next three years which is not bad considering the original estimate was uh, closer to 180 billion. So why does privacy matter to us as individuals? Uh, one of the most referenced papers is entitled uh, Why Privacy Matters Even If You Have Nothing to Hide. It's uh, by Daniel Solov, who's a law professor at George Washington University. And in his paper, he references the book by Franz Kafka called The Trial, which center, centers around a man who is arrested by bureaucracy but never told why he was arrested. It describes how surveillance leads to a sense of helplessness and powerlessness that alters the relationships between, the people, uh, between people and the government. He goes on to explain the irrelevancy of the argument of if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. The problem with that, the nothing to hide argument is that the underlying assumption is that privacy is about hiding bad things. It also makes the false assumption that those prying are not doing bad things themselves. And that is one of the main issues that in surveillance, those doing the surveillance do so because they don't trust the people, but the people have to trust those doing the surveillance. So in a documentary, Do Not Resist, on a ride along with the police officer, she showcases the camera system in her vehicle, which scans all the vehicles nearby if they're, to see if they're under investigation and scans bystanders to see if there's any warrants out on them. And she says, if you're out in public, there's no expectation of privacy. People say, you, just can't, you can't just scan my plates for no reason. She, yes, we can, she says. You just have to hope that everyone who runs them is running them for the right reasons. And there have been many cases in recent times which show that they aren't running them for the right reasons. And that's a concerning issue because there's a lot of data to be misused. Uh, in a report issued by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the NSA collected, it revealed that the NSA collected over 151 million phone call records while tracking 42 individuals. In previous years, that was actually billions of records that could have been potentially misused. So after the NSA leaks, Obama famously said that you can't have 100% security and also have 100% privacy and zero, in and zero inconvenience. We're going to have to make some choices as a society that there are trade-offs involved. James Comey, who's the head of, head of the FBI, um, said in reference to encryption, even our memories are not absolutely private in America. Any of us can be compelled under appropriate circumstances to say what we remember, what we saw. The general principle is one we've accepted in, our, in this country. There is no such thing as absolute privacy in America. There is no place in America outside of judicial reach. That's the bargain. We made that bargain over two centuries ago to achieve two goals, to achieve the very, very important goal of privacy and to achieve the very important goal of security. Widespread default encryption changes that bargain. And even though I'm giving this presentation, I kind of agree with them. Um, so in the book, The Walden, or Life in the Woods, by American philosopher Henry David Thoreau, the philosopher goes into the woods to, for, to live for a few years to see if he could not learn what it had to teach. And because he wanted to live deep and suck, all, suck out all the marrow of life. Uh, it's a very quotable book. But, be, but even living in the middle of the woods in the 1850s, this dude was running into people left, right, and center. And that lack of privacy in the woods still exists today. So 
At a conference in 2014, Arthur Van Der Wees of Arthur's Legal in Amsterdam said that privacy is a matter of person, himself or herself. Persons should be educated, educated of what the implications are when they share. And I think that simple statement kind of sums it up pretty well. Uh, privacy isn't an absolute condition. All of us in this room have different opinions which fall into the spectrum. Um, so Richard Clark, who's the former National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism in the United States, said during his keynote uh, at the Cloud Security Alliance Summit, quote, I believe we can have both security and civil liberties, but we can only do that if we keep a very close eye on the government and demand transparency and oversight and tell them we are not willing to trade our civil liberties for greater security. So going back to the paper by Solov, he warned that privacy is rarely, rarely lost in one fell swoop. It is usually eroded over time, little bits of it dissolving almost imperceptibly until we finally begin to notice how much is gone. So there may come a time when too much of your civil liberties are taken away from you in the name of security. And when that time comes, I think the movie Captain Fantastic has a good response to that. So when teaching his, children's, his children the realities of life, the protagonist says, we have to do what we're told. Some fights you just can't win. The powerful control the lives of the powerless. That's the way the world works. It's unjust and it's unfair, but that's just too bad. We have to shut up and accept it. Thank you.